Good evening, dear friends. Today it's the most famous story of, uh, in Soviet music history, or probably the most infamous story. And I'm sure most of you would know some bare bones of it. Uh, it's a story of a reformed composer. Uh, Stalin goes to the opera. He dislikes the opera. Two days later, uh, an article in Pravda appears denouncing the opera. The opera is banned. Shostakovich has to withdraw the big symphony that he uh, was writing, number four, and reform his style, change his style to write the fifth symphony, which is uh, then approved by the authorities. And uh, uh, at the end of it, we usually decide that Stalin won this round, or we decide that Shostakovich might have sneaked some kind of message of resistance or opposition into the symphony. So these are the bare bones, and I'm not going to dispute this story. I'm just going to add some details to it. And I, I hope that even those of you who know it very well will find something in today's lecture that they don't know. And those of you who don't know the story well, well, fasten your seat belts. So Lady Macbeth of Mtsensk, this opera, I'm not actually going to talk about it today because I've already given one Gresham lecture on it, which you can look up online. And uh, this is an opera which was based on an, a novella by Nikolai Leskov, um, adapted by Shostakovich. The title doesn't have very much to do with, with Shakespeare. It actually has much to do with Leskov. It's an ironic title. The alternative title is Katerina Ismailova. And this opera was premiered in 1934 uh, and the two titles almost simultaneously in Leningrad and in Moscow. And during those two years, it basically ran 200 times uh, in these two cities. And uh, that was something absolutely unprecedented, extraordinary, extraordinary success. <laughs> Even more extraordinary when you think of all the productions abroad you know, that took place during 35, 36 in those cities, such as Cleveland, New York, um, Prague, you know, London, and so on. Then finally, in December 1935, this opera is staged at the Bolshoi Theater, at the second stage, the smaller stage, but that means that Stalin comes to see it at that point. Yeah, he wouldn't go to any other uh, theater. Yeah, so this explains why he saw it so late. And on the 26th of January, um, Stalin attends the performance. Shostakovich is called in urgently to attend. And of course, he expects an audience with Stalin because that's exactly what happened two weeks later, earlier to one of his colleagues, Ivan Zerzhinsky. He expects to be praised in the same way as Dzerzhinsky was. Um, but in fact, Stalin leaves. It seems that he left after the third act, didn't see the final act. And Shostakovich is left in confusion and fear. Because again, that is something that had never happened before. So two, two days later, there is the article in Pravda, in the main organ of the Communist Party. And uh, the opera actually is not banned. Uh, yeah, it runs for a few more times in both theaters, and then it is withdrawn. Yeah, so there was never an official ban, but obviously the criticism was so severe that um, nobody would dream of performing it. So, uh, as I said, I'm not going to uh, talk much about the opera today, but um, we'll just give you a fragment to hear so that we can ponder why Stalin might have disliked it. Yeah, so, well, there's a famous sex scene in the opera, uh, which I'm not going to show you today. I usually do, but not today. Uh, which, of course, would have offended him, yeah, because he, th this grand man would not be subjected to any, anything like that, even though maybe not much was happening on stage, but the music was exceptionally graphic. Yeah, so we knew what was going on. Uh, another thing, you know, generally in the musical style, Shostakovich, um, does a lot of musical provocation. So he combines things that are not really combinable, you know, like musical hooliganism, parodies of polkas and waltzes, and next to that, you know, quite this sort of strident, dissonant, um, and very moving music. So how to make sense of that? I mean, even today, when you listen to it, you sort of feel torn in a different direction. Should you sympathize with the characters or should you not? You know, it's really difficult kind of aesthetically to comprehend. 
And the third thing, which probably was maybe uh, was a defining fact, it was extremely loud. Everyone comments that it was extremely loud, and it's not such a big theater. And it was a huge orchestra together with the, an addition of a brass section, which is called the banda. Yeah? So um, I'm just going to play you one of the untracks. This is uh, from a production by Richard Jones, a recent production at the Royal Opera House. And you will get this sense of sonic assault. <laughs> Having heard this, uh, you might actually <laughs> sympathize with the feelings um, of the person who was behind this article. So the, the, this is Chaos Not Music or Model Instead of Music. This is on the left. And then there was another article about his ballet, which is uh, like a week later. Uh, yeah, that um, the opera is inharmonious and chaotic, uh, that music is hard to follow and impossible to memorize. Mm, that uh, the composer throws himself into dense thickets of musical chaos, at times the purest cacophony, the expressivity needed by the listener is replaced by rab uh, rabid rhythms, the expression of passion is left to musical noise, yeah, and so on, like, so on. Uh, at first, of course, it was extremely terrifying for Shostakovich, and nobody could understand why he was selected like that. That was also completely unprecedented that Pravda would publish something like that against a particular um, artist. But very soon, uh, it turned out that it wasn't actually just about Shostakovich, and there was even a third article in Pravda which explained this, which said, actually, people in all the arts should listen to this. This is the new directive. You should all... Uh, get away from formalism and towards socialist realism. It's not just about Shostakovich. Yeah, so it became a huge campaign. And then there was a spate of further articles, uh, some of them also unsigned editorials, and some of signed by people, which had similar titles, Cacophony in Architecture, on Painter's Daubers, Cinematic Bunglers, Hackwork in Film Music, and they all had this you know, derogatory words thrown in, kind of in formality casual um, insults, basically, yeah, to various arts. And once people were told that um, 
uh, they were supposed to criticize their colleagues. Um, you know, it started happening just by itself. You didn't to do, need to do much more because some, some of the people were only too happy to promote their careers by criticizing their colleagues. But they also had to criticize themselves, yeah? So there was this ritual self-abasement happening. Uh, now, what was formalism? Uh, this word was bandied about for, for a long time, but I, I know that everyone always asked me, what is formalism? How can you explain what formalism is? So I tried to find out where it came from, and it seems that it, uh, as a term of a program, it has been, had been used since 1923. And there was Trotsky's article against formalist critics. There was a formalist school of literary theorists. Well, you probably might have heard this, the name of Viktor Shklovsky, uh, and uh, their belief in the primacy of form in art. Yeah, so that form determines content. So Trotsky criticized both formalism as a critical method and the kind of art that also privileged form, which we, he called futurism. Yeah? So he doesn't actually call the art itself formalism at that point. But later, the term kind of slipped and started being applied to everything that used to be called futurism and that today we probably would call modernism. Yeah, so all the, the modernist kind of avant-garde art, uh, challenging art, that experiments with form uh, was called formalism, mostly in the visual arts, but uh, it was also applied to music. And for example, in 1935, it was applied to a symphony by Shostakovich's friend, uh, Gabriel Popov, first symphony. And it was actually uh, Shostakovich's friend, Salertinsky, uh, whom we are going to mention more than once in this lecture, who used this term against Popov. Yeah, so it was already something that ha happened before. Well, in 1936, because um, I suppose they wanted to explain what formalism was, um, a philosopher uh, or somebody, one of the very few people who can be called a philosopher in the Soviet Union, Valentin Asmus, was commissioned to explain what that was. Um, so I was trying to get through, through the thicket of words because he really tried very hard, uh, yeah, but uh, this is the gist of it. So let's see what, how he explained it. So there are some unspoken assumptions there, uh, and one of them, the main one, is that art should always communicate a message, yeah, because uh, that's what it had to do in the Soviet Union. Yeah, art was supposed to be for the people, it had to communicate a message. And he says that artists should convey their message through expressive means that combine the old with the new. Just like in language, if you want to say something, you will not use the words that you invented because nobody is going to comprehend what you're saying. Yeah? So you have to, even if you can invent some words, but not all of them. Yeah? So you have to uh, combine the old with the new. The form of the artwork, he says, is the outcome of the artist's struggle to express the content as well as possible. So form is not the leading principle, it's just the means of delivering the message. Artists show mastery when the form is, is a such a perfect expression of the content that it is transparent to the readership or the audience. Yes, you shouldn't, your attention should not be drawn to the form. You should just think about the message. It's very typical of, of socialist realism when you think of that, this kind of transparent form. Innovation may be a byproduct of an artist's work, but it cannot be the goal. The appreciation of form is not separable from the appreciation of content. Formalist artists and theories, he says, wrongly believe that the struggle between tradition and invention plays out in the autonomous art world. But correctly understood, this struggle is only part of the broader social and political struggle Artists will participate in history and in the class struggle to a greater or lesser degree, and this will determine the conviction and passion of the artistic work. And here's a quote from him um, when he says that when the artist's walk is unsteady, his vision blurred, he is indifferent to the outcome of our great struggles for a new socialist world, and it is here in this class position that formalist gimmickry emerges. And that's where the formalist delusions of theorists are born. So you can see that when translating it into normal language, yeah, <laughs> it means that when you write a modernist piece, a challenging modernist piece, it means that 
you are not believing in socialism enough. You're not uh, the right builder of socialism. Yeah, so uh, this is basically the implication uh, of all the Shostakovich criticism, both in 1936 and as, as late as 1948. That's always the implication that if you're doing something like this, that means you are not, not exactly the Soviet artist. You're somehow lacking. Yeah, so it's a dangerous accusation. Formalism. So, uh, what happens next? Um, well, obviously, Shostakovich uh, at that point uh, is absolutely distraught. He is trying to seek an audience with Stalin, but he is never given one. Uh, instead, he is given an audience with Platon Kirchenzov, who was basically the equivalent of a minister of culture. He was called um, chairman of the um, Committee for Artistic Affairs. And he knew Kerzhenko from the 20s. They, they knew each other. Yeah, so it wasn't somebody that he didn't know. But Kerzhenko is now a very powerful man. And he tells him, and Shostakovich says, you know, what, what do I need to do? Do I need to write a letter? Do I need to apologize? And interestingly, uh, he says, no, you don't need to. So actually, Shostakovich never participated in all these discussions. He never had to apologize for this. He never had to deliver a speech of contrition. He says, you have to write, write music. The, the response to this criticism will be in your music. And he also uh, advised him to go and collect some folk songs. Yeah, because remember, I was telling you last time that folk songs were always a very um, secure path to socialist realism. Yeah, so, um, yeah, why don't you go around the country, collect some folk songs, and change your style in that direction? And the problem was that Shostakovich had already written two movements of a new symphony, a huge symphony, symphony number no. four. Um, I'm using here some art, as usual, and this is uh, the, uh, the painting that was produced um, during the, uh, as the symphony was being played, yeah, live painting. So that expresses a particular part, yeah, the code of the Allegro uh, of symphony number no. four. And you can see yeah, how uh, intense it is, yeah, how expressionist it is. So then the third movement, which is the final movement of the fourth, he wrote during the most acute phase of this crisis, yeah, when people weren't talking to him, when he was getting very little support, and people who were giving him support, such as Meyerhold, for example, had to, at the same time, criticize themselves. Yeah, Meyerhold made a, a, a paper which is called Meyerhold against Meyerholdism, yeah, because Meyerholdism essentially is formalism. So they had to... Um, go through, through, or through, jump through all these hoops to, to somehow deliver a message of support. And some of them just stayed silent, but even if you stayed silent and didn't participate in the discussion, your name would be in the paper saying, this person hasn't said anything. Yeah, so you couldn't even stay silent. So um, he completed the symphony. And if you imagine that the symphony would be performed at that point, it would be taken as a response to criticism. And his friend Solertinsky, that I already mentioned, acting as a spokesman in February 1936, actually promised, he said, that the composer would deliver a Soviet musical tragedy, a Soviet heroic symphony. And of course, he knew already this symphony. This, he is talking about the fourth. Well, the symphony is extremely challenging. It's, it's an amazing piece of music, but it lasts for more than an hour. It's also extremely loud. It has a very confused uh, sort of sense of narrative. It's very difficult to describe it, of what actually happens. For example, in the first movement, there are sort of seven or eight or nine huge climaxes. I'm going to play you one of them. Um, and then a huge contrast after that with something that seems to be ridiculous and overblown and, you know, possibly can be taken again as offensive. <laughs>
so you, when you give a lyrical tune to the tubers, yeah, you must be somehow mocking it, although it, does, it sounds terrifying at the same time. But, but this is the kind of thing that is happening. But there was something else which is probably was even more important, and that's the, the finale of how the symphony ends. Uh, we were talking that in socialist realism, you always strive for a happy ending. So it seems that just that's what Shostakovich is doing. He is striving to this happy ending, and it almost happens. We're getting to this huge climax, uh, and the, you will see the, the timpanists are, are going yeah, in, in, in this rhythm, and uh, it's all very exciting. It's in the major key. And then something happens at the crest of that climax. And the funeral march, which was there from the beginning of the finale, starts to take over. Yeah, so it sours the mood, and you get the opposite of what you were expecting. Yeah, the, not the, the wonderful happy ending, triumphant ending, but uh, a slow, a very slow and gradual fading away. So I'll just play you the, the, how we're coming up to this climax and get, getting out of it. Major key, C major. goes on for a long, long time. So imagine this in the climate of 1936. So what happened in 1936? Well, first of all, other very prominent figures uh, also experienced the fate similar to Shostakovich. For example, the writer Mikhail Bulgakov, whose plays were taken off the stage. And uh, other the theater directors such as Meyerhold himself and Tairov were criticized almost every day in the papers. Yeah, their theaters were worried that they might be closed down uh, any moment. But then it became much more sinister because in August of 1936, the first uh, major show trial took place in Moscow where former revolutionaries, the very famous Bolsheviks, became enemies of the people. And that really was an all-consuming story. Yeah, everyone was discussing it or not discussing it, reading about it in, in the newspapers and could not understand what was happening. I have read a lot of diaries from that time, and it seems that most people, the absolute majority, believed what was happening. They didn't think that, that these accusations were fake. Yeah? But they still couldn't understand the behavior of those accused of why they uh, basically were prepared to tell these, these most ridiculous stories of what they did. Uh, so there was something very strange psychologically, very, very disturbing. 
And so the, the, the country was gripped by this show trial. And then after that, in the wake of that, people were executed basically the, the same day or the next day after the sentence. And uh, after they were executed, there was a wave of arrests and uh, expulsions from the Communist Party and denunciations of people who knew the accused. Yeah? So the wave started spreading further and further. Uh, and one of the people arrested at that time in the autumn of 1936 was uh, Shostakovich's brother-in-law, the, the husband of his sister. Yes, yeah, so it came as close to actually members of his family. And there is a very interesting letter from Shostakovich's professor, Maximilian Steinberg, former professor yeah, from the Conservatoire. Uh, sorry, it's not a letter, it's a diary entry. And uh, Shostakovich visits him on the 30th of November, and he says uh, that from Shostakovich, he finds out that two people whom they knew, yeah, who were basically accountants in the, one of these um, creative organizations, composers' organizations that they belonged to, um, got a death sentence for some financial crimes, which were, of course, com completely incommensurable with, with, the, with the crime itself. And he says, well, it, it is so strange. Yeah, you've dealt with this, these people so many times without ever suspecting anything like this. Yes, he doesn't tell you whether he believes that or not. And in the same sentence, in the same paragraph, basically, he says that uh, Mitya, yeah, Shostakovich, is in great doubt uh, about the forthcoming performances of the Fourth, fourth Symphony. Yeah, so it's basically part of this, this whole narrative. The context uh, is, is terrifying. So, nevertheless, he went ahead with the rehearsals, and as the rehearsals progressed, you, you know, can you imagine rehearsing this symphony? It's very difficult. Uh, musicians started complaining, why should we play this formalism? <laughs> yeah, and um, then the chairman of the Leningrad Union of Composers and another party official and head of the Philharmonia all came to Shostakovich and suggested that he might withdraw it. And indeed, it would have been absolutely crazy not to. So that was actually salvation, I think, for him. That, that was actually a good move. It was the right move. This is a very interesting little deviation, uh, a, a little meme. They're just to explain that this, this, uh, this story of a reformed composer who abandons one symphony rights a new one already existed in fiction. Um, a playwright called Alexei Faiko created a, a play and put it on in March 1936, so well before anything was known about Shostakovich's Fourth Symphony, about a composer who uh, writes this formalist symphony and then eventually he decides not to conduct it. He was about to go on stage, the play is called The Concert, and then he, he cancels it. And then uh, with the help of his younger pupil, he writes a new symphony. Yeah, so he becomes a reformed composer. Now, look at this composer. Yeah, he's on the right. Uh, I think he looks remarkably like Shostakovich. Yeah? So even though the play was actually written before any of that took place, but when it arrived on the stages, they certainly wanted to make, put Shostakovich on stage. So even before Shostakovich withdrew his fourth symphony, he did it on stage first, yeah, and then in real life. I think it's, it's quite amazing. Another interesting detail about it is that the music for this play was written by Shostakovich's close friend, Shebalin. Uh, well, Shebalin was his friend, and his graduate student, Hrenikov, who you might know, then later became uh, head of the Union of Composers. And um, well, I, I don't know, I still need to do more research, but it seems that Shebalin wrote the formalist music and Hrenikov wrote the reformed music. Yeah, so it was a kind of double act. Uh, I also wanted to point out that basically almost everyone at that period had to change their style. Every artist, in some way. Those who didn't, uh, basically just had to stop being published or performed, yeah, and I don't know, become janitors or something like that. So completely fall out of the artistic world. So another prominent ex example is the, the film director, Sergei Eisenstein, uh, who actually is known as having you know, said the, this phrase, they are not going to make a Shostakovich out of me yeah, when the campaign starts again against uh, him. And somebody wrote it in a diary, so that's how we know. 
And indeed, uh, his uh, film about collectivization and the Bergen Meadow was uh, withdrawn 11 days before it was due to be finished. Yeah, it was withdrawn and everyone thought it was destroyed. Later it was found, but nevertheless, yeah, he had to completely change his style and he did this big patriotic thing, Alexander Nevsky, next year. So yeah, that's exactly a parallel story to Shostakovich. This is just to prove to you that uh, almost everyone else had to do something like that. So we come to symphony number no. five, uh, and I've chosen, that's another painting about the symphony. It's a Venezuelan allegory, but you can see even from the painting that it's much, much more organized. Yeah, it's much more classical, like the symphony. It has this forward um, you know, progression, um, and it has some kind of classical balance. And indeed, the fifth symphony is different in style, even though you can still hear that this is Shostakovich. Uh, there are different models that Shostakovich follows. Uh, it's not necessarily so much Mahler, although a little bit of Mahler, but there are also references to Beethoven and Tchaikovsky, yeah, who were um, obviously the inspirers of socialist realism at, at that time. So instead of uh, eight or nine climaxes in one movement, you will just have a single one. Yeah, and if you have just one uh, peak, yeah, then it becomes narratively much easier to, to comprehend how the music develops. So in many ways, the Fifth Symphony, even the fact that it's not three movements, but the four movements as, we, as we're used to, yeah, four movements, and it ends in the major key with a, with a triumphant climax. Yeah, so in all these respects, the, the uh, Fifth Symphony was much more palatable. Uh, but the chronology of it is also uh, extremely telling. I mean, just want you to imagine yeah, at what time it was, it was written, because the context of 1937 was, of course, even worse than of 1936. So Shostakovich had already procrastinated, yeah, because of the, the fourth symphony, yeah, and hadn't come up with any response to the criticism. So by March, Kerzhentsev started getting worried and actually said, uh, come on, you know, colleagues of Shostakovich, you have to help him. You're just ignoring him, but you have to help him reform. And right after that, it seems Shostakovich starts writing his fifth symphony. Surrounded by arrests by people that he knew professionally, such as director of the Bolshoi Theater, uh, the mother of his wife, uh, the astronomer Sofia Varzar, uh, you know, then the, the trial of, uh, of his brother-in-law, who is sentenced to 10 years, and probably uh, most um, worrying of all for, for Shostakovich personally, it was the news of the arrest of his patron in the party, very high-standing patron and friend, Marshal Tuchachevsky. So Tukhachevsky is, uh, is very soon uh, yeah, arrested, executed, and uh, we know basically down to two days when now that Shostakovich visited another friend that they had in common to play him the symphony, the first two movements of the Fifth Symphony. And by that stage, they probably both knew that Tukhachevsky was already gone. And in fact, that friend, Zhilayev, Nikolai Zhilayev, was, was arrested precisely for his connection to Tukhachevsky a few months later. So we can ask ourselves, you know, was it just pure luck that Shostakovich didn't get arrested? And there is a story that he was called for questioning, but then, you know, his um, interrogator was arrested himself, yeah, it, and came to nothing. Or perhaps uh, Shostakovich was to some extent already protected. And uh, if, if we so we investigate that train of thought, um, the one thing that could have protected him was participation in the writing of a film score um, for a film which is called The Great Citizen. It was the film uh, that was basically the justification of the purges. Um, and it's, it's a paradoxical situation. So on the one hand, yeah, Shostakovich is the victim of the purges. All the people around him are arrested and uh, sentenced to, to either death or... or 10 years of, of in the Gulag, and at the same time he is collaborating in basically promoting the purges by writing a film score for this film. 
And this film was basically co-written by Stalin. Yeah, Stalin interfered in the scenario. So the director of it was Friedrich Hemmler, who was very close kind of to Stalin. He was a very on, on good terms with, with the Politburo, probably involved with the Secret Service. And that's the kind of project that Shostakovich is involved in. And he writes this, this film score right after the Fifth Symphony, and he actually uses a very similar musical phrase in the title sequence for the film. So let's hear it. So this is the title sequence for the film. <laughs> heard that phrase, that fanfare, yeah? So uh, I don't know whether you heard the timpani in the first extract, yeah, because the, the sound is so bad, but actually there was the timpani there as well. Yeah, so you have both the fanfare and the timpani strokes. Um, as a quotation from the symphony. And perhaps retroactively, it might have um, acted as a kind of insurance policy, because in the film, this theme is associated with the victory of the revolution. Yeah? So if that is what that theme means, then that's what the finale of the fifth as well means as well. So uh, the symphony it was premiered on the 21st of November in um, Leningrad by the conductor Mravinsky, and it became a huge success with the public. It's hard to say whether people gave Shostakovich a standing ovation because they loved the music so much or because they wanted to express his support, support for him, because that was the only way that he could, they could express this support publicly, you had to stand up and clap for 10 minutes. And, uh, you know, we know that some of them were crying. And generally speaking, the reaction to the symphony was not uh, unanimous. People actually mostly write about it. They, they remember the, the slow movement, the requiem slow movement, yeah, which seemed to have touched their hearts. And uh, not so many people actually enjoy the very ending, which I've just played, yeah, that some people think that it's a formality that he basically sold out. Other people heard it as not a triumph at all, but something um, worrying and you know, describing this repetition of the same note as battering in, yeah, or hammering in. So people were already writing about this in their diaries and letters at the time. And uh, eventually, you know, the critics were won out to the, to the cause, um, but uh, there was, you know, a, a description even by, by one of the listeners who says, well, Shostakovich is in his study, engrossed in his abstractions, and this is the banging on the door, you know, the objective world is trying to get in and telling him, yeah, to basically get engaged into the building of socialism. So you can see how this ending also became, uh, you know, got an autobiographical narrative in it. People were actually seeing it as the reform itself, as the criticism of Lady Macbeth, yeah, and now the reform itself in the symphony. So, so they, they perceived it as an autobiographical work. But very interesting things happened quite recently when scholars um, discovered something else in the symphony. And indeed, there is an autobiographical dimension, but which takes us in a very different direction. It all started with uh, people noticing a quotation, almost a direct quotation from the opera Carmen. And I'm going to play you the, the famous habanera and then the symphony. And I promise you, you will not be able to unhear it. <laughs> So l'amour, that's what I'm talking about. Thank you. 
Can you hear this? Yeah. Uh, and then you know, once you've, we've noticed that, uh, uh, we we start looking. I mean, not we, but there was a, a musicologist from uh, from the Ukraine um, who's called Alexander Binditsky who discovered this connection uh, with a. Um, with a woman, uh, Yelena Konstantinovska, you can see her picture here, uh, whom Shostakovich was uh, madly in love with around 1934, 35, uh, to the point that he actually divorced his wife, but then uh, we found out his, his wife was pregnant, so he remarried her again. Yeah, but so it was, it was a serious relationship after that, you know, Lala, uh, Elena Konstantinovska was arrested and he kept in touch with her. Then she was sent to Spain, the connection with Carmen. Yeah, she was sent to Spain during the revolution, Spanish Revolution as, a, as an interpreter. And there she met this dashing fellow uh, who's called Ramon Carmen. Carmen. Yeah, and uh, uh, whether they were married, uh, really married, I, I don't know. But she became known as Lala Carmen. Yeah, so um, if, you, if we start looking through, through the score of the fifth, more and more of these quotations and connections with Carmen can be, uh, can be found. Uh, for example, now let's, let's hear the, the continuation of that. This little motif. Yeah, so the same motif, yeah, slowed down, becomes the fanfare that we already connected to the Communist Party and the victory of, of the revolution. Yeah, it seems to be coming from the Habanera. And it's in the same key. That's what's, what's so beautiful about it. So you can actually hear this connection. So once you, you, know, you get onto this wheel, you can explain the whole symphony as basically a love symphony, a love poem for Lala Carmen, including this very famous uh, hammering in 250 times the same note, la, this note A is repeated. La, yeah, in Russian, la, la. Lala. Now you're not believing me, but I, I'm absolutely convinced this is the, exactly the kind of thing that Shostakovich would do, and I'm going to prove to it, it to you a bit um, further. I mean, how wonderful to think. I mean, of course, it's a challenge for all of us uh, to see this as a lot of symphony because we're already sort of uh, uh, so uh, accepting the, this narrative as a civic narrative. But I think it's wonderful as well, because if you read the diaries again of people at that time, Shostakovich didn't write a diary, but other people sort of spoke for him. And surrounded by these horrible things when they couldn't really talk to each other, where the social fabric was torn, um, the only escapes, there were two escapes, and one was in, in work. Yeah, in this, um, you know, bouts of intense creative work when you could forget what was going on. This is exactly what Shostakovich is doing with his Fifth, fifth Symphony. And another thing was love. And, um, I mean, I was reading the diary of Mikhail Prishvin, um, one of the writers who was absolutely obsessed with the trials and reading the newspapers. And then he falls in love and stops commenting on that altogether. Yeah, the only thing that, that he talks about is, you know, what he managed, managed to kiss or touch, you know, <laughs> completely obsessed with something else. So that is something that can supplant even, even the most horrible things that were going around him. And I think it's wonderful that Shostakovich uh, creates this, this symphony out of his personal true impulse because it makes it authentic and I think that is why it's not just a socialist realist work that is imposed on him, it's not just a change of style but it's also an authentic piece of music and this is why it, uh, it had such success with the audience. This is another meme, yes, yeah? so Shostakovich kills Stalin a second time, as you can see, the, the rails here, it's a, uh, it's, it's a, a lovely print produced by a conductor yeah, who put the, um, 
the code of the Fifth Symphony on the rails, this, yeah? And uh, Shostakovich is drawing a metro train over Stalin's body, which I think is rather nice. Um, finally, now I'm going to, um, to advertise our musical treat. Um, of course, we can't play the Fifth Symphony or the Fourth Symphony, but we're going to do something equally exciting. Uh, and um, the musicians are going to perform for us six romances on verses by English poets, which Shostakovich wrote in 1942, yeah, so five years later. Uh, there are six poems, six songs, and they're going to be performed in English, although Shostakovich wrote, used the Russian translations to write these songs. And each of these songs is dedicated to a particular friend. Yeah, so there's a lot of personal messages in this. The first one, um, yeah, Sir Walter Riley to his son, uh, which tells you about uh, the, the wood, the weed, the wag, yeah, this wonderful alliterative um, line, uh, which basically talks about the danger of execution, yeah, the danger of the gallows. And Livon Atarmian, the friend of Shostakovich that this is dedicated to, uh, was a bit of a wag himself, as we know from his memoirs. He was proud of being a rogue. Yeah, so I think there is a personal connection with the poem. There's also a personal connection um, with the key. Yeah, because A, again, the key of A, or La, Livon Atarmian, you, you get the, the same principle yeah, as um, in other works. It's a cipher. Yes, so the, the key of the piece uh, refers to Atagnan. Uh, the second one, uh, which is by Robert Burns, is, is a very lovely tender poem dedicated to his wife Nina Varzar, uh, which is kind of self-explanatory. Uh, the third one, Macpherson's Farewell, uh, again, another poem about execution. Huh? Strange, isn't it? Um, that such things worry him at that time. So uh, that's dedicated to Isaac Glickman, another uh, very close friend. Um, sometimes the connection is very difficult to know. That this, this rather um, sort of slightly bawdy poem by, by Burns uh, is dedicated to his favorite student at the time, uh, Yuri Sviridov. We don't know why, I don't know why. The fifth one, I think, is the most important one because this is dedicated to Solertinsky. I already mentioned him yeah, twice today, and I'm going to mention him again because this is a Shakespeare sonnet 66. And uh, uh, he was a very, very close friend, probably the closest friend of all. And basically, when you read the sonnet, it's like a description of the times. Yeah, and, and right perfection wrongfully disgraced, and strength by limping sway disabled, and art made tongue-tied by authority, and folly doctor-like controlling skill, and simply truth miscalled simplicity, and captive good attending captain ill. Actually, can refer to our present situation as well, easily. Um, tied with all this from this, would I be gone, save that to die, I leave my love alone. Uh, the translation that he used replaces the word love with friend. So, yeah, to, to leave my friend alone. And this is a very, very strange song, and I think it contains a lot of interesting things. The sonnet is number 66. The tempo is minimum equals 66 beats per minute. Uh, the first interval is a six, yeah, and the, 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 then it's kind of another six, yeah, ascending and descending. There is a 66 in the, in the first phrase. Um, there are other numerical things uh, that you can find. For example, the 14 lines of the sonnet are divided in four plus three, three plus four, and musically, so there's a lot of mirror symmetry in that, in that song. Uh, Solertinsky was a polymath, and he was someone who was very interested in early music, so there's possibly a, a, allusions to maybe Handel or, or Lully, or some, somebody, some kind of early music, and also music that relies on, uh, on ciphers and numerology. There is also something else. Um, it's in the key of G again, and uh, G, the, the, the Russian um, word for G is Sol, yeah, Sol Lertinsky. Of course, he has to be in G major. And this Sol, this, this G, is repeated in the bass for most of the song. 
And the other note is, is C, yeah? Again, Solertinsky Ivan, you can imagine it as, a, as a, his initials. And the, the note that is missing from the G major triad is a D. Um, actually, th this is, I just wanted to mention that Solertinsky wrote a book on Shakespeare, so Shakespeare is also, <laughs> uh, it's important that this is Shakespeare. And at the very end, that's before uh, that last line, yeah, when, when Shakespeare says, you know, save uh, that I, I were to live my, my love, my friend alone. And this is when we get the D in the bass, and the D is Dmitri. And uh, that moment where we, the, the first oval, uh, it has an E flat, which means in, in German system, we would call it S. Yes, D and S at the same time. D and S come in there. Shostakovich comes in the song to greet his friend. I think it's marvelous. I only discovered it two days ago. So I don't know whether anyone has noticed it. And again, D, S, D, S at the very end. It ends with a D. Yeah, and the final song is dedicated by Shabalin. And it's almost another meme of uh, uh, worldly fame and disgrace, yeah? The king goes up, the king goes down. Also prophetic for Shabalin, who had just become the director of the Moscow Conservatoire and who six years later will be disgraced and removed from that post. But of course, also a story of Shostakovich, who was extremely um, famous, yeah, composer number one, and who survived this moment of disgrace and then went up again, only to go down again in 1948, and we will get to that a couple of lectures later. So finally, now to our wonderful musical treat. Uh, we are in, if you have your um, transcripts, I don't know what you were given them. Um, I, I put some the, the poems on the, on the sheets. We are going to have Edward Hawkins and Kerry Owen performing, performing them for you. And I'm going to invite them now. Hemp grows, the wag is 
dungeons dark and strong, the wretch's destiny. Macbeth's and time will not be long on yonder gallows tree. Oh, what is death but parting breath on many a bloody plain? I bared his face, and in this place I spawned him yet again. Untie these bands from off my hands and bring me to my sword. And there's no man in all Scotland but I'll bring him at a word and live the life of scourge and strife. I die my treachery. My heart I must depart and not have mended me. I've lived a life of scourge and strife. I die by treachery. It burns my heart. I must depart and not have mended me. Now there will light the sunshine bright and all beneath the sky. And shame this stain his name, the wretch that dares not die. <laughs> say rantingly, say wantonly, say dauntingly, gave he. He played a spring and danced it round below the gallows tree. And 
quite perfection wrongfully disgraced. And strength by limping sway disabled and art made tongue tied by authority and folly doctor like controlling And simple truth miscalled simplicity, and captive good attending captain ill, with all these from these would I be Never went up again.